Thank you, Tulin. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be here uh, and to, to be here uh, to see uh, the distinguished lectures by, by Yosef. Um, and Tulin, thanks so much for all your work in, in organizing the meeting. Uh, I should say that uh, Yosef's last talk was a perfect setup for me because I, I do want to talk about Krilov subspace methods for uh, uh, what are called inverse problems. And I'll, I'll mention what I mean by this in a minute. Um, this is uh, joint work with a variety of people. And so I didn't put them all on the first slide, but I'll, I will mention them as I go along through the, the talk, a variety of students and colleagues uh, as well. So um, that, and this is a nice picture of the, my building at Emory. Uh, if you haven't been to uh, Emory sometime, come and visit. It's, uh, uh, I think, a wonderful campus in, in Atlanta, uh, right next door to CDC. So uh, I don't know whether CDC is a good reference frame anymore or not, I don't know. Anyways, we are there. Um, so let me, uh, I'm gonna go through um, the talk in this way. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit of the basics of inverse problems, what are they? Uh, and then talk about standard Krelov solvers, an introduction a little bit, um, just to build off of uh, Yosef's uh, talk. It'll have uh, uh, some, some introductory slides in there and, and sort of build my own notation for these sorts of things. Um, I'll talk about um, the idea for using these things for uh, inverse problems, which have a certain special characteristic. They're ill-conditioned problems in a sort of special way. And then we'll use them to, to uh, compute solutions that have sparsity constraints on them and low rank uh, solution constraints as well. So I'll, I'll try to get you through all of those sorts of, uh, of things. All right, so I don't know if anybody's seen this before. You probably can't see anything on there, read it at all. It's a flow chart. It's the backslash flow chart that you can find in MATLAB. And I love backslash because it does so many different things. You don't even think about it, right? You just say, hey, backslash, B and it does something for you. And, you know, maybe using some of Tim's codes and maybe using some of somebody else's codes, right? So it's great, right? It checks whether uh, it's a square matrix. If not, it's going to go do some sort, of, some sort of QR solver. If it's square, then it's going to figure out, is it triangular? And then use a back, a back solve or a forward solve on it uh, or pseudo triangular, if you like. Um, is it Hermitian? Uh, should I think about using Cholesky or not? And it does all of this check for you and you don't even need to think about it. I love it. Uh, such a wonderful uh, uh, command. So my wife asked in that course, how many lines of code are inside backslash? And it was kind of answer. She couldn't tell the metric or the secret, but she couldn't add that. The number was too big. Too big? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. a quarter million lines of code. Yeah, I mean, you think about, okay, so if it's a sparse matrix, what is it doing there, right? I mean, it's just incredible, right? There's a lot of stuff going on in there. Uh, and it does it, I mean, you know, pick a matrix, make it pretty big, right? It can be pretty big and dense uh, and you get a solution very fast. It's kind of an amazing uh, command if you ask me. Um, so, so I wanted to want to think about inverse problems here. And so inverse, by inverse problems, I mean a particular kind of linear system. So uh, instead of solving AX equal B, I want to think about solving AX equal B, but I don't really know B exactly. So I know AX is sort of my true B, which is noise free, but then I have some noise added to it. And the only thing I can measure is B, All right? So, so I wanna to try to solve, compute an approximate solution of X by knowing this noisy B. And the other thing that is important about these uh, problems is that matrix A is ill-conditioned, but ill-conditioned in a, in a sort of special way. So the singular values decay gradually to zero. And there isn't a gap to look for to say, I have a numerical rank that's obvious to me in these problems. Okay, so it's generally what happens. The other issue is that, um, and this is sort of an advantage in some sense, uh, typically with these problems, the large singular values correspond to singular vectors that have uh, sort of low oscillation. So if you plot the singular vectors, they look you know, sort of kind of not oscillating very much. As you get to the tiny singular values, you plot the singular vectors, they oscillate a lot. Okay, so I can't prove that that's true for every single inverse problem, but it's generally true. All right, so, um, so I can say, okay, well, noise is small. Uh, I'm just gonna forget about it. And I'm gonna hit it with backslash, solve AX equal B. And if you do that, um, you get this, uh, uh, I mean, you get truth out, right? So if I say, okay, I'm gonna just hit it with uh, uh, backslash, it's essentially applying A inverse to B. 
So I apply A inverse to AX and I get X. That's the truth. That's the thing that I want. But I also get A inverse applied to the noise. So I'm going to get a solution, a, a computed solution that looks like the truth plus some noise. And if the noise is small, you say, okay, well, it's probably just fine. But in general, it's not such a good solution. It's generally not a good approximation. And if you've not seen this before, I think it's worthwhile to see on a toy, toy example. So I'm going to do a few uh, MATLAB examples. And example zero there is just to remind me of which example to, 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 to do. So I wrote these things as scripts. Uh, and so I have a bunch of them. So I'm going to do uh, this example zero here. So I generated a matrix. This only has 256 columns and 256 rows. Uh, and I plotted over here on the left the singular values of that matrix. So you can see how they, they decay to zero. So if you look at the, the condition number, uh, largest divided by smallest singular value, it's going to be a large number. But it's larger. Um, uh, the, the, the biggest problem is that there's not a gap in the singular values to indicate numerical rank. So what are small singular values and what are large singular values to you? So you can say, I'm going to cut it somewhere and say, anything below 10 to the minus 6 is small. Anything above is large or okay. Uh, and actually, it's going to depend a lot on what your noise level is. So I'll illustrate this to you um, by just doing the following. I'm going to plot the right-hand side vector. So all I did was take vector B and I plotted it. So it has some zero entries in it, some not zero entries in it. Anyway, that's what it, if you just plot the vector B, that's what it looks like. <clears throat> then I'm going to add a little bit of noise to it. And I'm going to plot the same thing, but with a little bit of noise added to it. And you can see there's a little bit of squiggles in there, but the two are not so different from each other. So what I'm going to do, in the, I'm going to replace B with A backslash B so you can see what the solution looks like. All right, so, and I'll plot it along with the truth. So here's um, the noise-free B. So I hit it with A backslash B and I plotted the truth and you can't really see it on this, uh, on this uh, 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 screen, but there's a red and blue plotted right on top of each other. So, the truth and the computed solution are pretty good. They they're about the same. Now, if I do the same thing for <clears throat> the noisy data uh, and plot truth on top of A backslash B with noisy B, uh, I get something that looks like that. So you can see the red there. It almost looks like a constant curve. But the reason it looks like a constant curve, if you look at the scale on the y-axis, if you like, um, it's, it goes up, to, uh, up and down to 10 to the, minus, uh, 10 to the fourth, All right? So um, if I zoom in on it, you can see it's just oscillating up and down, okay? So as I said, there's small singular values correspond to highly oscillating singular vectors. And when you divide by small singular values in the inverse, it, it magnifies those high oscillations. And that's all you see in the solution there. All right, so this, this is just a toy example just to give you an idea of... Uh, what can go on in these sorts of problems. So just hitting it with A backslash B is generally not really what you want to do. So you're going to get poor solutions to this. Now, what you can do is a variety of different things. If SVD is something that you can compute, you can say, OK, well, I'll truncate. Uh, I'll compute a truncated singular value decomposition, if you like. So, uh, so, so if you look at that, uh, this uh, uh, computed solution, if I have n singular values, I'm going to truncate at some k values here. So if I took k equal to n, this would be the inverse solution, the thing that looks like garbage. So what I can do is truncate it uh, so that I, I sort of throw away division by small singular values there. That's a good idea to do if you can compute the SVD. And as I said, if I come back here, you can say, OK, well, pick a k where you want to truncate from. The more you truncate, the smoother the solution, but maybe the less good the approximation. <clears throat> and of course, um, you can do other things as well. You can solve uh, what's called a standard Tikhonov regularization. If you've seen these problems before, this is a, a common thing to do. Uh, you, you say, well, instead of trying to solve AX equal B exactly, what I'm going to do is try to balance minimizing the residual along with not letting this piece get too big either. All right, so, and, and what, how much weight do you put on this is, depends on this parameter alpha that you have to choose, called a regularization parameter. And you have to make this trade-off between how much weight do I want to put on fit to data term, right? So how well do I want to fit the data? 
compared to how much weight do I want to put on not letting the solution blow up too much. You know, if I go back to the solution here, you say compute the norm of this, this highly oscillating blue stuff over here, it's going to be a big norm. Okay, so you say, okay, well, I don't want it to get that big, so I'll put a parameter alpha here to put more weight on that. So there's a balance there that you have to do. I'll show some examples uh, in a minute. Um, you, you can write this out as a singular value decomposition solution if you want to, right? I can either solve this least squares problem directly, or I can put it in, in the SVD of A and, and carry it out. And it looks like um, an inverse solution where I'm sort of waiting. Uh, if these, these guys get tiny, I, I sort of dampen those things out. So I don't let them uh, uh, be computed in the solution. So it acts kind of like a truncated SVD, if you like. There are many other approaches you can do here. So this is sort of a generalized uh, filtering kind of technique where you say, pick a filter factor that should be one for large singular values because it has information about the solution and make sure that this, this, this phi sub i is close to zero for small singular values. So you don't divide by those tiny uh, singular values and, and blow up the solution. <clears throat> How you choose that filter factor is up to you. Pick your favorite filter. You have your own uh, filtering solution. Yeah, so that's what I just said. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of doing these things um, is highly dependent on the problem and also depends on what parameters you choose. And you have to figure out how do I choose those things? You may make a guess, you may have some intuition based on your application. Uh, and I'll talk about, um, uh, mention a few other techniques later. All right, oh yeah, so maybe I'll mention them now. There are a couple of techniques you could use. One is called discrepancy principle, another is uh, generalized cross-validation. There are lots of other techniques as well, uh, but these are the ones I'll probably concentrate on most uh, in this talk. Uh, actually, I probably won't say much about precisely what these methods are because it will take me too far afield, uh, but there are techniques and, and they're not so hard to use if I know the SVD of my matrix A. All right, so um, if you want to play around with inverse problems, there's a, a software package, a MATLAB software package that you can get. Uh, it's called Regularization Tools from Per Christian Hansen's website. Uh, it's a great toolbox. Download it, has a bunch of test problems that you can play with. You can use SVD techniques to compute solutions and so forth. A great package to use. It's all based on though being able to compute the SVD of your matrix A. So if your matrix isn't so big and you can compute an SVD of it, um, go for it. By the way, I think this is related to some of the uh, uh, conversations that we've already had today. Uh, if your matrix A is extremely large and sparse, uh, I want to compute an SVD. The problem is, is that my you know, singular vector matrices are not going to necessarily be sparse just because A is sparse. And in fact, as Joseph said, often the sparse techniques require you to compute maybe just a small fraction of your singular values. But if I need a large percentage of my singular values and corresponding singular vectors, that's key, uh, these techniques may not work so well. All right, so uh, what can you do? Well, um, of course, you, you want to go move into iterative methods for these things instead of using uh, uh, SVD. Now, one of the nice things about standard Krilov subspace methods like conjugate gradient method, LSQR, GMRAS, and so forth, if you run them as an iterative method, they actually mimic what happens uh, in these kinds of problems like a truncated SV. That is, if I stop my iteration at 10 iterations, I get something that, it, so, so suppose I say, don't drive the residual to zero, drive it down to a small level, but not to zero, I get something that looks like a truncated SVD solution. I'll show you an example in a minute. Uh, on the other hand, you may say, well, uh, instead of just running my iterative method on AX equal B, what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'll incorporate my regularization term in there and I'll run my iterative method on, on that guy right there. Of course, it requires me to choose this, this, uh, this regularization uh, operator, if you like, and also this regularization parameter. And again, I'm gonna mention something about this uh, in, in, in a minute and show some examples. So let me come back to the flow chart, uh, backslash. So backslash was really nice if my matrix is not too ill-conditioned and not too, well, it could be pretty large, but not, not too large and still works great. It figures out what to do. 
hard to do with inverse problems. There's so many different options and not all of the options work well for, for all, all problems. But I think uh, if we combine SVD techniques with uh, Krelov subspace methods, we can do something. And I'm gonna show you that uh, in this talk. All right, so let me, let me say something about the uh, framework for these uh, standard Krelov subspace methods. And Yosef uh, uh, talked about this just earlier uh, this afternoon. Um, basically, the idea is you, and I'm going to couch it more generally rather than talk about Arnoldi or Lanchos or Golub Kahan. Uh, I just want to think about a standard sort of approach where you generate a set of uh, uh, orthonormal vectors. We'll just assume exact arithmetic for now. Orthonormal vectors, uh, they go in these matrices VK and UK plus one, and I keep adding vectors as, as each iteration goes on. And the relationship between these orthonormal vectors and the big matrix A. Uh, is related to this small tiny matrix uh, T. So it could be Hessenberg matrix, if you're thinking about something like GMRES, uh, could be a tridiagonal matrix uh, for Lenchos and symmetric problems, could be bidiagonal if I'm thinking about uh, a, a least squares like problem for Golub Kahan bidiagonalization. Uh, so, so I just want to think about this as a tiny matrix here. And basically, the way you do in the, in the Krilov subspace methods, as Joseph uh, mentioned, is that you say, okay, well, uh, instead of solving the full least squares problem with the, or the full uh, AX equal B problem with matrix A, uh, I project it down to this tiny problem, solve it, and then project back, All right? So, so that's the basic idea. Um, and so, uh, so as I mentioned already, um, one of the nice things about Krilov subspace methods for these inverse problems is that they mimic TSVD. And the reason they do is if you've not done this before is that often it, um, this matrix here, in the early iterations, we'll pick off the large singular values uh, of the matrix uh, A. That is, if you were to compute the singular values of this TK, it's say like a K by K matrix, if you like, um, it's for its K singular values will approximate the, 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 the largest K singular values of A pretty well. Uh, and you can easily do this in, a, in a, an experiment without um, much difficulty. And you can see that happen. And as I iterate longer and longer, of course, I start picking up the small singular values. And those are the things that, that cause me trouble in my solution. So the idea is then to, rather than, as I said, drive the residual to zero in my, in my iterative method, drive it down to a point where I think the solution is gonna be good and then stop. So you call it early stopping if you like. All right, so um, we wanted to, we had a, a lot of different uh, techniques that we were developing related to Krelov subspace methods for, for inverse problems. And we wanted to put the, tool, the, 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 the codes together so that people could use and also provide some test problems for people as well. So we put together this, um, this package we call IR tools. Uh, and this is again, joint work with Per Christian Hansen who's at uh, Technical University of Denmark and uh, Silvia Gazzola who's at the University of Bath. Uh, and um, well, let me just say something about the way these methods work and, and I, I'll do it by um, get doing some examples. So as I said, there really isn't a backslash for inverse problems, but I would like these iterative methods to, if I can get something that looks like a, a backslash. So just give it A and B and do something to it, All right? So compute a solution. So let me, let me run this, um, this example here. Um, All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set, we have these uh, set of test problems in the package as well. So this is a, a seismic inverse uh, uh, problem, uh, imaging problem. And so what I did is I generated, actually I'm running these codes real time. I didn't pre-compute anything. So uh, this PR seismic will set up a test problem. It has no inputs to it. So it just sets up a default test problem for you. Um, so it has, uh, it returns a, a matrix associated with it. It could be a sparse matrix. It actually may not even be an actual matrix. It might be a structure. Uh, all I need for iterative methods is be able to do mat, mat vec mult with A, maybe with A transpose, depending on the problem. Um, uh, I have a true right-hand side and a true solution that I wanna try to, 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 to compute an approximation of. And of course, to mimic uh, a realistic problem, I need to add noise to it. So we have a function called, we call PR noise. We just add a default amount of noise. You can change the level of noise if you want to. 
um, by changing the inputs to that function, but it's just for illustration, we'll just do the default. All right, so here's what the data looks like. Um, the middle here is, uh, of course, the true solution. You can see it written up there, and this is my measured data. So the noisy uh, uh, right-hand side data, if you like, visualized as an image. And you can think about this maybe as two plate, uh, tectonic plates meeting each other. Uh, in any case, um, uh, if I run this uh, 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 iterative method, it's a conjugate gradient method, CGLS method, uh, and I'm just gonna run it for a default number of iterations. Now it's gonna try and figure out its stopping point if, if you like, but it, it didn't find anything. So it ran to a maximum number of iterations uh, and I plot the solution and uh, looks pretty good. Looks all right. Um, actually, I would say uh, it looks a bit noisy to me. It's overfitted. So I, I ran too many iterations actually in this, in this particular case. So here's what I'm going to do. So since I'm just playing and I know what the true solution is, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to, I'm going to put on options into my method that has the true solution into it. That's cheating, right? You give, them, you give the, the, the method your true solution, but it allows me to, to experiment a little bit. And I'm going to run it again. And um, so I'm going to run, rerun it. Uh, and what I'm going to do is that each iteration, I'm going to compute the, the relative error between the truth and the solution that I computed at each iteration. And this is just for if you like pedagogical reasons. Uh, and in the left here, I'm gonna plot uh, the relative error at each iteration, All right? So, uh, so that's what it looks like. Um, so uh, at first iteration, uh, I have a certain relative error and as the, as the iteration proceeds, the error goes down. That's what you would like to see, of course. And uh, of course, uh, what you see here then is the error goes up uh, as uh, uh, the iteration proceeds. And that's really not what you wanna see, of course. Um, Sometimes, yeah, sure. Is there any book version of the solution that's used to figure out the Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna try and mention that a little bit. I won't tell you exactly um, the mathematics behind it, but I'll mention something about that in a second, where the bottom is. So this is relative error compared to the truth. And of course, I don't know the truth, so I don't know how I'm going to figure out where the bottom of this is without knowing the truth. But you have methods that can estimate where it is, and I'll, I'll actually illustrate that in a minute. Uh, but you're right. So I wanted to stop right around here. Now, this is sometimes called semi-convergence in the inverse problems literature, but it's really not a, a good word because uh, the method does converge to something. It just converges to the thing that you don't want. It converges to A inverse B, and A inverse B is not the solution that you want. You want something that's not uh, uh, A inverse B here. I don't really know what the true B is, right? It's noisy. So I wanted to stop there if I could. And uh, if I did, I probably would have had a better solution. Um, but of course it's cheating uh, without having, I, I can go back and rerun it for 20 iterations and you would see a much better solution, um, but that's cheating. All right, so what do you do if you wanna compute a good stopping uh, iteration? Probably the easiest one is to use this thing called discrepancy principle. So fit the discrepancy. So you know that um, uh, in these problems generally, um, the solution, the right-hand side is B equals AX plus noise. So if I look at the residual B minus AX, it should equal the noise. Now, I don't know what the noise is, but maybe I know a bound on the norm of the noise. And so if I could do that, I might say stop when it reaches approximately the bound of the norm, norm of the noise. And if I do that, I might get a good solution out. Um, so in our codes, you can do that. You can just set the options to say, okay, I know what the noise level is put that in with the A and the B and then see, see what happens. All right, so let me just run it uh, and see. And let's just see um, if it stops uh, about um, where the 20 iterations is. Okay, so I just put that in and then I run it and, oh yeah, okay, so it stopped. Um, it said stop at some, some number of iterations. So let me plot the solution. Oh, so you can see it stopped at, I don't know what it is, 17 or 18 iterations, something like that. Uh, not quite at the bottom, but pretty good, actually, pretty good. Uh, and that's what the solution looks like. So I think it looks better. I mean, there still is, it's not perfect, right? It's an inverse problem. You're gonna have these uh, artifacts around boundaries and so forth. You can't expect perfection from this because you don't know the right-hand side data uh, perfectly. Uh, I, say, I think that's actually a pretty good solution there. All right, um, so, all right, say, okay, well, great. 
Uh, you got to know the norm of the noise. What if you don't know the norm of the noise? Say, okay, well, let me, let me do this. Rather than solving it as an iterative method that has to be stopped at some point, <clears throat> let's just use this basic idea of ticking off regularization where I'll put on this, this, this guy right here and I need to pick a parameter alpha, pick a number. I don't know, I pick 20, whatever 20 means. I have no idea, it's just a number. Um, actually I do in this problem, I know it's a good number because um, I sort of cheated, but anyway, that's all right. It's my talk, I can cheat if I want to. And so uh, here it is, I put it in and I run it. Now it's gonna run for a number of iterations. So notice the error, the way it goes down and then bounces back up. Um, with, the, with an alpha in here, it's gonna come down and hopefully not go back up in some sense. It may, it may not, I don't know. Uh, but if I plot the solution, this is what it looks like. So uh, uh, on the right here, I plotted um, uh, uh, the solution that I did with the discrepancy principle. It figured out how to stop at 16 iterations. And here I did the ticking off and I just let it run uh, until it finally decided um, it was good enough and uh, it stopped there. Okay, but it, again, this required me choosing this parameter. And if I don't know what that parameter is, uh, it can become difficult. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the matrix is uh, scaled weird, right? So mostly people would say number, your regularization parameter should be between zero and one or something like that. It's mostly what your intuitive thought would be. But actually it should be between your smallest and largest singular value. And uh, I haven't shown you what the largest and smallest singular values are here, so yeah. Um, scale it by, divide by the largest singular value and you'll get a number, yeah, so, so thanks, Mark. Um, it's a, yeah, you could do that. Yep, that's exactly right. So you could use an a noise estimation uh, te uh, technique. The only problem is, is that, you know, if you run this thing, you, you look at, there really are very few iterations in here where you have flexibility, right? So if you don't get the noise level exactly right, um, you may stop too many iterations too, 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 too long, or you may stop too soon. So it becomes tricky. I mean, it's a good idea. Um, and people use those techniques, right? So if you don't know anything else, you have to try something with these problems, right? So you pick something. And often, typically what you do is you, you, you compute a solution and you say, okay, it looks pretty good. I guess that's what I wanted. So, these, so let me just come back to this, this idea of, of figuring out what's the properly regularized solution. The, the methods like discrepancy principle, and later on I'll mention something about generalized cross-validation again. These are not, foolproof methods, they're guides. So they guide you to something that might work, but they may not as well. Okay, so, all right. Yeah, so what if you don't know a good alpha and you don't know the noise level, what do you do next? All right, so this is where um, we wanna come back to Krilov methods and talk about what are called hybrid uh, solvers. And, um, so let me come back to the idea of Krilov subspace uh, solvers again. So the idea is here at each iteration, you're going to compute some orthonormal vectors, whatever they are. Um, and you're gonna compute this uh, tiny problem and you're gonna solve it. And then you project back to get your solution at the kth iteration, basically, right? Um, so, so if I come back to um, this guy right here, you know, I'm putting regularization on my, on my solution, my big problem here, right? A is a big matrix here. So why not do the following? Uh, instead of putting regularization on the big matrix, why not add regularization to this tiny problem here? So again, as my iterations proceed, um, I'm picking off small, uh, the largest singular values of matrix A. The, the, the singular values in matrix T are picking off the largest singular values of matrix A. As the iteration proceeds, I start to pick off smaller and smaller singular values. So at some point, I should think about adding regularization to this problem right here. And it's a much smaller problem to worry about than the big problem in the beginning. And the advantage of doing this, right? So that's what I'm gonna do. And the advantage of doing this is that you have techniques that um, can estimate the, the regularization parameter that don't require the noise level. One is this thing called generalized cross-validation. And uh, I don't really wanna, I didn't prepare to say anything about it, but let me just say it's a technique that um, it's not so difficult. It's a one-dimensional minimization problem to find the, the, 
the optimal, if you like, alpha, but you need the SVD to really do this, right? Now, the, the, the good thing about applying the regularization on this tiny problem is I can compute the SVD of this tiny problem without any difficulty. I then um, use a one-dimensional minimization uh, scheme to figure out what is the optimal alpha for that iteration, and then I proceed. Uh, and uh, um, it doesn't work all the time, but it works pretty well many times. So we call these hybrid methods. And uh, if it's a least squares problem, we use something called LSQR. You can also do it um, via um, a GMRS type method as well. Uh, so, so again, it, it, it allows us to be able to estimate regularization parameters and uh, uh, do things quite efficiently on the projected problem. We can also use the, the, the stuff that we're computing at the projected problem to estimate when the stopping criteria should be. And again, it's all based on these, uh, this thing called generalized cross-validation that I'm sorry I didn't uh, prepare to tell you about. Uh, it's a whole nother talk in and of itself. And again, using the methods, you can just give it A and B and see what happens. So let me, let me just show you that for this particular problem, it, it actually works. So all I'm gonna do is just call it uh, with A and B. Just give it A and B and run it. And uh, it's gonna try to figure out a regularization parameter. It's already done, right, by the way, anyway. So it, it tried to figure a regularization parameter at each iteration. And at the same time, try to figure out when a good stopping um, uh, criteria was, all based on this thing called generalized cross-validation. It's using SVD of those projected problems to figure all of this out. It's pretty fast. And so here's the solution I uh, 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 plotted it on the right here. Uh, and it compares to the solution that I, I got when I guessed at the regularization parameter, when I, I used an educated guess at it there. So pretty good, right? It figured out the regularization parameter on its own and it figured out a stopping iteration. Uh, and I think this is uh, actually a, a, a pretty uh, powerful thing, quite honestly, especially, so this actually comes up, I think it's something that Yusuf mentioned a little bit about, uh, you know, in machine learning these days, there's a lot of numerical linear algebra going on, and some of it requires solving regularized, regularized, taking off regularized problems in some sense. And so, and in the training process, you've got to solve a bunch of problems. Uh, and so, having techniques that can actually figure out regularization parameters for you uh, is really, uh, I think, critically important. So here I plotted on the left, the regularization parameter. So in the beginning, um, it doesn't really need any regularization at the first couple of iterations. Then uh, after a few iterations, it guesses at a regularization parameter, but you, know, you don't have a lot of information yet. The, 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 the tiny matrix doesn't have very much information about the big matrix yet. It needs some iterations before it starts figuring it out and it eventually does uh, and figures out what a good regularization parameter is. All right, so let me come back to my talk. All right, so, so again, yeah, we have um, GMRES-based uh, versions of these things as well. Um, and you can think about, um, uh, instead of uh, just uh, trying to keep the, the norm of the solution from blowing up, you can keep the norm of something times the solution from blowing up. For example, the derivative of the solution, maybe you want it to be even smoother, something like that. Um, there are techniques for that as well. I wanna to come to another uh, problem, which is uh, in some sense a bit more challenging. And this is um, uh, uh, mixing uh, this two norm fit to data term with a regularization that now is not quadratic. The reason we saw, uh, form this regularization problem is, is, is typically it approximates what you might get if you wanted to put a sparsity constraint on your solution X. I wanna say I want X to be sparse. So a lot of zeros in it. Uh, and so, so this, this problem uh, uh, generally uh, uh, computes a good sparse approximation to a solution. Now, the difficulty is this mix of norms in here. And, and you know, if you just say, okay, well, it's not a least squares problem anymore. I'm not really sure how I hit it with the Krylov subspace method. So what you can do, and this is not uh, anything new, um, is to use something called an iteratively reweighted norm approach. So what you do is you say, okay, what I'm gonna do is uh, this offending uh, norm that's uh, not quadratic, 
uh, I'm going to replace it by a two norm, a weighted two norm. So the weighted two norm approximates my one norm. And for, for, for this, this is pretty simple, right? You just, you take this weights are just one divided by the square root of the entries uh, of, your, of your vector in some sense. Uh, now, of course, I don't know what my true solution is. So I really don't know what those weights are. So the iteratively reweighted part is that you say, take a guess X zero at your solution, make a set of weights, replace this guy with the weighted norm, solve a least squares problem, get a new solution, get a new weight, then resolve your least squares problem again, over and over again. Now, of course, it requires you solving these large least squares problems over and over again, and that becomes very expensive. So this is the work that Sylvia and I did some years ago. Um, so what we decided to do is say, okay, well, let's take a look at this thing. If I write it like this, this is what my weighted uh, two norm thing's gonna look like. You can think about moving this W over here and replacing X with uh, W K X with an X tilde, if you like. So maybe let me call it like that. So if I do that, um, what I, I don't know what you think about it, but uh, when I look at this thing, I look like, it looks to me like a preconditioned matrix here. So A times a preconditioner, if you like. So I have a least squares problem, but I have a preconditioner in here. <clears throat> the challenge here is that your preconditioner depends on your solution. So at each iteration, I have a different preconditioner, okay? So you can't just hit it with a general Krelov subspace method. This is where you need to use flexible Krelov subspace methods. So you have an iteration dependent preconditioner, but if you hit it with that, um, it turns out this works pretty well, works pretty well. Uh, and you adapt your, 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 uh, your, your weights as you go. Now, you may, you may have asked the, the question, maybe you didn't, but uh, anyway, so this is one divided by square root of the, the entries in vector X. If your vector X has zeros in it, you get one divided by zero and you're in trouble. Okay, so mathematically, maybe I'll just add a fudge factor to it. On the other hand, as soon as I uh, move it over to the other side, I invert this guy right here, and now it becomes a multiplication by it, so that fudge factor really doesn't uh, play a role anymore in some sense. So it all works out, comes out in the wash. All right, so again, these, these methods, we wanted to make them easy for people to use, right? So you, you, can, you can add options to them if you want to, but you can make it easy to use as well. And uh, just to illustrate to you that it works, you know, I'm using the same test problem over and over again because I think it's uh, sort of fair to do that. Um, and so let me run it with this, uh, this uh, L1 solution. And again, it's gonna try and do, it has to do a little bit more work per iteration, but it still runs pretty fast. Um, and I figured out, again, a good stopping criteria based on GCV. It's also trying to figure out that regularization parameter as it goes. Uh, and uh, let's see, did I plot the solution? No, here's the solution in the middle. So compared to the hybrid LSQR that dude's ticking off regularization, quadratic, quadratic, quadratic fit to date, quadratic regularization. In the middle is quadratic fit to data, one norm regularization. So there's a difference there. Uh, is it a difference to write home about? Maybe not, but um, uh, still, still work pretty well. And again, um, it tries to figure out the regularization parameter as it goes. It took more iterations to figure this out, um, but it figured out uh, a good regularization parameter for it as well. All right, so that's the L1 guy right there. All right, so um, here I wanna talk, uh, uh, do something similar, instead, but instead of using um, a sparsity constraint on my solution, I don't care if X has a lot of zeros in it anymore. <clears throat> I might want to assume that X has low rank. And by low rank, I mean, X is a vector, okay? It has a rank one, if you want to think about it as a matrix, right? Um, but what I want to think about it is Kronecker rank. So can I uh, decompose it as a small sum of Kronecker products? And the word rank makes a lot of sense because if I reshape this vector X, it's a vector, I can reshape it as a matrix if I want to. Um, and if I do, uh, this, these terms, these Kronecker terms turn into rank one uh, products. So the matricized version of my vector, right? Reshape it as a, as a matrix, um, looks like a low rank uh, approximation of that. All right, so that's where the term comes in. And this actually um, may occur naturally in, in especially imaging applications where you may have not a lot of structure in your image. 
All right, so, uh, all right, so, so let's see. So yeah, that's what we wanna do. So our first approach was um, sort of motivated off of some work that occurs uh, that is, um, uh, is in the um, uh, sort of stochastic PD literature. Uh, and that is to, to uh, sort of use a, 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 a Krilov subspace method on it, um, but to, to constrain the things that you compute in the Krilov subspace to have low rank. So by that, I mean, um, again, we're gonna compute these orthonormal vectors and whatnot, um, and our, our tiny matrices that may be Hessenberg and triangular or whatever, right? Those are tiny matrices. Uh, and then I want to constrain um, these, these things to have low rank, okay? So, uh, so sorry about that, I went too fast. Um, so, so constrain these things to have low rank. Now, um, this becomes uh, problematic uh, in, in many ways. Um, so one, another way to think about it is to add um, what's called a nuclear norm uh, rank uh, 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 constraint to it. So remember when I did the um, sparsity regularization, I had the two norm fit to data and one norm on my solution vector X here. So instead of the one norm here, I'm gonna put what's called a nuclear norm here. So I'm gonna reshape my vector X into a matrix. I compute its singular values, and I want to keep the, the sum of those singular values small, right? So the idea here is that that would then um, sort of give you singular value sparsity uh, and low rank uh, constraint on it. So this problem is tractable actually. All right, so um, there are a variety of methods to, to solve these problems. Um, and so what we're gonna do is similar to what we did in, in the L1 constraint. And I'm gonna go kind of fast on this because the math is, I don't know, kind of ugly in some sense. Um, but the idea here is again, uh, I want to, to try to uh, do our iteratively reweighted norm approach on this, change this guy, whatever it is, P norm between zero and one to uh, a two norm. All right, so, uh, so, so again, there's a, a variety of techniques that are on it. We wanted to think about it in terms of this, this iteratively reweighted norm approach and to couch it in terms of Krilov subspaces with uh, uh, an iteration dependent preconditioner. So here's what it looks like. And again, I know it looks like a big mess here. Don't worry so much about the algorithm. Um, the idea here is that you have this big stuff here, a weight times vector X, but it's all in the two norm here. Now this stuff here, I know it looks messy, but it's computable and it's um, efficient to compute. And so, so it involves chronicle products and diagonal matrices, but you know, it's pretty simple to do. And again, we can think about moving this stuff over to the other side uh, to the fit the data term and thinking about it like preconditioning. So that's basically the way we would do it. Um, so, so that's, yeah, so let me come to here where I move it to the other side uh, and I get this sort of preconditioned kind of idea going on here. And again, it's a, an iteration dependent preconditioner. So you need to use flexible Krilov subspace methods with it. Uh, I don't have a demo for this. Um, so again, let me just whip past the algorithms because they're just not really worth looking at. Um, but let me just show you some results. So the idea here again is to think about um, uh, solutions, uh, uh, images that may have low rank structure to them. This one is sort of corrupted by um, some blurring, I think. And then there's um, some missing pixels in here as well. Uh, if I were to run the standard LSQR algorithm uh, or our hybrid LSQR method, I would get a solution that looks like this. If we put the, um, uh, the sort of low rank constraints on it, so low rank constraint, I get something like this. Uh, if I use the nuclear norm uh, constraints, I get even a little bit better. And there are um, uh, different versions of these things that we had, but, but in any case, um, I think you get a pretty good solution out here. Uh, we don't have this yet in the toolbox. That's why I'm not showing you a demo of it. Uh, not because I didn't, was afraid to show you. I just don't have a good demo to set up for you yet. All right, so let me, let me end here. Uh, and just say that I think these idea of Krilov subspace methods is quite powerful. Um, you can think about it as iteration dependent preconditioned uh, versions of the Krilov subspace methods. You can incorporate different kinds of regularization and they're quite powerful because it allows you to adaptively choose regularization parameters as you go. Instead of looking at the big large scale problem and figuring out what do I do with it? I can look at these small scale problems and work my way up 
uh, to what I think are good regularization parameters. And I think this is a, I think, do think this is a, an extremely powerful idea. Um, so we put all this stuff together uh, in a package, uh, MATLAB package. So you're welcome to download it if you like uh, and play with it. Um, it has a bunch of um, uh, uh, well-known methods in there, methods we didn't um, invent or anything like that, but we wanted to put a bunch of methods in there so for people to use and compare with. Uh, it's built off of, uh, also it, it, it connects to this thing called air tools, which has tomography problems in it. Um, <clears throat> and you can use it in a variety of different ways, you know, figure out uh, if you need a test problem, use one of our test problems. If you need an algorithm, use one of our algorithms. If you want to show that you can beat the pants off of uh, uh, our algorithms, feel free to do it. You know, a citation, even though it, you beat us, is still a good citation. Um, anyway, I do think it's uh, quite useful to provide code for things. And I know um, uh, Tim and Yosef and others here are in the same uh, boat. They like to provide code for people to use. And I think that's uh, something that we should do. Uh, so here's some links to the, um, to the paper and to, to the codes. And with that, I'll end. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So, um, that was the slide. Could you put that in the last five minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, 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 so imagine I have a matrix and I wanna uh, string it out into one long vector. I would take it column wise, right? Now the opposite is to take the column wise thing and then reshape it back into a, a matrix. So, so, so that's why the inverse note, it's not really an inverse uh, operation, but it's to reshape. So in MATLAB, it's, a resh it's, it's called reshape. So I can reshape it into a one dimensional vector or I can reshape it into any dimension as long as the dimensions match the number of entries I have in, in, in my vector, yeah. So it's, it's a good question because it's arbitrary in some sense, it's back inverse. You know, what do you want, what, the, what, is, what is the uh, dimension of the matrix that I do it? Is it, you know, 100 by 10 or is it 10 by 100 or whatever, right? Usually in the imaging problems, the, the, the shape of it is, is natural. It depends on the, the, the image size that you have. And so, you know, if it were medical imaging, I would know the size of the pixels the, or voxels that I'm interested in getting. And so I would reshape it based on that size. Mark, did you have a question? Yeah. No block Krilov methods, no. You know, often in these cases, um, you don't uh, you don't need so many iterations uh, because you know you know the, the number of iterations depends on the number of good singular values uh, that you think you're going to compute your solution to, and the more ill-conditioned the problem, more ill-posed the problem is, the fewer you need. It's kind of a, a weird to think about that. The more ill-conditioned the problem, in a way, the easier it is to solve. You converge very fast, right? Well, converge whatever the converge means you stop very, really fast because you can only squeeze so much out of the data. Yeah. Question? Yes? Um, so like this, uh, you know, we really implement it like that. Uh, we really implement it like it's a preconditioner. Yeah, yeah, right. So each iteration, your preconditioner changes at each iteration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, in this case, it's just a diagonal one. In the other ones, it was uh, in the nuclear norm, it's a bit more complicated, right? But yeah, here it's just a diagonal matrix. So, so it's easy to, it's really easy to, to, to apply, but it does change at each iteration, but it is, so, you know, when you think about the original papers on flexible uh, Krilov subspace methods were say, okay, the preconditioner really didn't change a lot at each iteration, but it still seemed to make a difference to be able to use flexible methods rather than not flexible methods. Here, the, the preconditioner can change a lot at each iteration. So it's cr uh, critical that you use the, the flexible methods. Yes, that's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so the preconditioner here is, 
not to speed convergence. It has nothing to do with trying to make your, 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 your iterations go faster. It's trying to put you, pre so, uh, so uh, Daniel Calvetti likes to call them prior conditioners. So you're trying to add priors to your data to say, okay, the, what is the kind of solution that I want? So this guy has nothing to do with increasing convergence speed. It has everything to do with what kind of solution do I want to um, uh, get? Yeah, I mean, you would have if, if you if you kept W exactly like this, but you can have a little fudge factor to it. But on the other hand, when you apply it like this, the division goes away now. I guess I'm sorry, it kind of cheats in a way. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, yeah, um, so so you have a singular system here, but you're you also have this 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 guy below it, right? So if you write it as an augmented system, right, you have A W and then alpha i on the bottom in some sense. So in some sense, you're getting rid of that singularity because of the alpha i down there. I didn't mean, yeah, so, so, so do you have a question about the noise? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's a great question, right? So, uh, so the usual assumption is that you have uh, IID uh, Gaussian white noise for your, your, you know, so it's normally distributed, uh, very nice noise. And a lot of the parameter selection techniques work well for that kind of thing. But you can, of course, have different kinds of noise. Um, you can have uh, Poisson noise, um, you can have multiplicative noise, you can have uh, um, sort of uh, in this picture here, you can sort of think of these, um, missing pixels in some sense as uh, what might be called salt and pepper noise. Um, so you can have a variety of different things. Now, um, the techniques that I described here, uh, uh, well, let me not go all the way back through it, but um, they work pretty well for white Gaussian white noise. Uh, for other noises, it depends. Uh, I mean, but doesn't everything approximate if you have a, if your sample size is large enough isn't there some theorem about that sample size is large enough everything is gaussian or something like that uh, but yeah you're right um, it depends a lot on the noise and we're not trying to to do anything tricky about the noise in this in this particular case yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is a great, uh, uh, yeah, this is a great uh, comment. So here I'm assuming A is known exactly. What happens if you don't know A exactly? And there could be a couple of different things. You could, you could think of it like a total least squares problem, right? So I can say A plus some, some error in it is like B plus some error in it. And I can try and incorporate it with there. On the other hand, typically what happens is that uh, A is a, a function. And so, so, so the, to get A, it depends on certain parameters. And the parameters are the things that you don't know. So then you can, you can write it like an optimization problem. You say, OK, I'm going to minimize over uh, finding x, but also the parameters that define A. It becomes a nonlinear, a mixed linear, nonlinear problem then in that case. Much harder uh, to do. It's a great, great observation, yeah. 